welcome. My name is Elodie and I will guide you through the lesson API Queries in Jupyter Notebook. Today's tutorial is part of the Querying Art History Data on the Web series, which is produced in cooperation with the Friedrich Schiller University of Jena and the project Digital for Humanities. The tutorial series contains various methods of querying, modeling and analyzing art history data. The tutorial builds on the knowledge units of the previous series, querying museum data on the web. In particular, the video Semantic Web and API Queries is recommended as an introduction to API queries. You can access this introduction via the Digital for Humanities project website. Today's video builds on your prior knowledge and not only introduces you to API queries for your own research in an application-oriented way, but also introduces you to the use of Jupyter Notebook. During the working process, the Python programming language is used, but prior knowledge of Python is not required to formulate initial research questions as API strings. First, we will turn to the link between APIs and the databases of museums, that is, why museums allow access to their databases via API queries. After that, we will get to know our workspace for today's lesson. In the second part of the tutorial, we will use the V&A Museum, the Victoria and Albert Museum in London, as an example to pose research questions as API queries in Jupyter Notebook. At the end, I will give an outlook on how the data obtained through API queries can be transferred to other digital tools such as OpenRefine and Palladio to refine datasets and visualize certain aspects. Afterwards, it is also necessary to highlight the limitations of this research method. So, let's start by answering the question of why some major museums, such as the MoMA and the V&A Museum, have set up a query service that works with what is called an application programming interface. Basically, the API automatically transmits the researcher's queries to the museum's server and the service responds the data back to the client. Thus, the API facilitates the transfer of data between two programs. The API is best explained as a collection of functions and commands, a set of rules that can be executed on web-based systems, operating systems, database systems and computer hardware. What are the benefits to a researcher of querying museum data via an API? The data received is basically raw, and individual records can be linked together through specific queries. Also, unlike the information on a museum's website, the server being accessed usually contains more up-to-date and detailed information about an object from the museum's collection. On the other hand, the museum can distinguish itself as a research institution by supporting independent research on its collection. A museum's database can provide meaningful information for the following research areas. Provenance, gender representation, object biography, the occurrence of specific materials in certain epochs, history or development of the museum's collection, and acquisition periods. For example, the V&A Museum, which will serve as the main example in this tutorial, uses a REST API service. This means the data can be retrieved and modified using the HTTP methods get, put, post, delete. Get is used to request data. It is the main method you will use as an independent researcher to receive data. Besides the unified and predefined set of operations, the REST API is based on URLs, an aspect that will be explained shortly. API strings that can be inserted in the browsers as URLs can be built step by step in Jupyter Notebook to operationally concretize a research question. The Jupyter Notebook is thus a digital workspace where we can develop and present data science projects. As a notebook, it integrates codes and its output into a single document that combines visualizations, narrative text and mathematical equations. So, in a single document, you can run, code, view the output and add explanations, formulas and diagrams. 
Jupyter Notebook is fast part of your data science workflow. It also helps you communicate and share your results in a transparent, understandable and appropriate way. To effectively perform API queries, the URLs are part of a set of commands expressed through Python. Python is a general purpose programming language, which is applied in data science, data analysis, machine learning, data engineering, web development and other fields. The commands written in Python to query data from the VNA API are listed in the VNA API guide and can be used in Jupyter Notebook. Only the API strings, your research question in the form of a URL and some variables within the Python code need to be customized. Before we take a closer look at how to create a complex API string step by step with research questions in mind, let's briefly look at the more technical part of running Jupyter Notebook and using Python. You will need first to download the latest version of the Python package and environment manager Anaconda. Follow the installation instructions for Mac iOS, Windows or Linux from the Anaconda download website. Deciding where to install Anaconda is important because the directory contains all the files and folders you can access through Jupyter Notebook. So in general, I would advise you to save Anaconda under Users. After installation, you can access and load the Jupyter Notebook dashboard from the Anaconda Navigator or by using your terminal window and typing Jupyter Notebook. Jupyter Notebook works through your default browser. The navigation bar is self-explanatory. To create a new notebook for your project, click on New and select the Python 3 option. This notebook will be saved in the directory you have previously selected for Anaconda. Once you open your notebook, you can use two different types of cells. So-called code cells are used to capture an input and return an output when the code is executed by clicking the Run button on the toolbar. The code cell is executed on the kernel, which is the computation engine that executes the code. The code cell can include the import of libraries and functions, including arguments, parameters and variables. You may wonder what it means to import a Python library and run a piece of code, a function. As a researcher who wants to run API queries, you don't need to write new code. Instead, you import Python libraries, which are usable pieces of code that you want to include in your project. The smallest unit of a library is a function, which is an instruction. Several functions form a module that can be used to display images or animations. So overall, you will use several functions to return the output of a query in Jupyter Notebook. In our case, the VNA API guide provides full access to the codes you need to enter in the code cell to perform a successful query. Nevertheless, you need to install the libraries separately before importing them into Jupyter Notebook. Via the Anaconda Navigator, you can see which libraries are installed and therefore available on Jupyter Notebook without additional installation. In order not to go beyond the scope of this tutorial with technical intricacies, I would recommend you to read online how to install new libraries using the command pip install in your terminal application. In general, a code cell refers to the content of previously executed cells for instance, imported libraries, functions, arguments and parameters. So the workflow should be from top to bottom. If you have multiple cells in your notebook and execute the cells in the correct order, you can use your functions across cells. So divide your code into logical parts. It is not necessary to put all your code in one cell. Markdown cells can be created from the navigation bar by clicking on cell and selecting cell type markdown. Markdown cells are used to write simple text that is not part of a code. Lists, headings, notes and images can be included in the notebook. To distinguish the text cells and highlight certain words, you use markdown syntax, which you can explore online. For example, asterisks and hashtags are used to create headings, lists and bold and italic fonts. As mentioned earlier, we will now be working hands-on with Jupyter Notebook using its capabilities to execute and document API queries. Theoretically, as well as practically, 
one can already approach a museum's API service with a specific research question in mind. However, it is also possible to be interested in a museum's collection without having a specific research question. For example, I am particularly interested in 19th and 20th century photography from North Africa and West Asia. Fortunately, the v a Museum has a large number of photographs from North Africa and West Asia and has its own API guide. Before I started my research, I had these kinds of general questions in my mind. Was the v as collection of photographs from West Asia and North Africa temporarily related to actual photographic endeavors in Wana and ideologically related to the imperial enterprise of the British Empire? Is historical orientalism reflected in the photographic motives that have attracted the interest of European museums? Who were the collectors of orientalist photography in late 19th and early 20th century Europe? While browsing the v a Museum's API guide, I discovered what information I can query for each object and how I can link them together via an API string. As a result, I formulated more specific questions. Did the v a Museum collect photos of the most popular photographers working in Wana? Did the v a collect orientalist photos at the same time as the photo studios were coming up in Wana? Which photographic subjects are more represented in the v a photo collection from Wana? From which places do the photographs originate? Do these locations correspond to actual historical photo studio hotspots such as Istanbul, Cairo, Beirut and Tunis? With these questions in mind, let's get back to the API string. At first glance, you can see that the API string is embedded in code. The entire query string in the form of a URL contains an HTTP GET request, a controlled vocabulary and several parameters to limit the number of objects potentially returned. The format of the output data is JSON. If we read the code, we see that we imported the requests package and the JSON module. The requests library is a popular library for sending the HTTP requests post, get, delete in Python. This means that we request data in JSON format from the VNA server using Python's requests library, call the request get method and pass the Darchet URL as the first parameter. The destination URL ends with a question mark. The following parameters are separated by ampersands. At the end of the code, the response from the museum server is retrieved using the print function and the JSON dumps method. Which code you need for your specific query can be found in the VNA API query guide. Now that we have an overview of Python and Jupyter Notebook and query strings, we can delve more deeply into the various query methods offered by the VNA API. The most comprehensive search you can perform is for the occurrence of a word or the absence of a word anywhere in an object record. This is a good starting point to find all objects that match your search in the broadest sense, since all object records containing the word are retrieved. You can also specify the search by specifying certain fields to match Q. These fields are limited to a certain degree and are specified by the V&A Museum, such as object name, object title, object type, place name, material technique, actor. Finally, the query string can be refined by including the Boolean method, in particularly the fuzzy operator can help with typos, some variation in spelling and singular and plural forms of the word. However, the returned object records may be insufficient because the same word may be used in multiple meanings. Therefore, using filters instead of keywords in a second step can be the best option to get more precise results. As you can see, the number of returned object records matching Egypt shrinks enormously when you apply the restricted text search and finally the filter ID of Egypt. So in summary, filtering by identifier, the last query we run, gives the most accurate results.
The identifiers are part of a controlled vocabulary of the V&A. Partially, the vocabulary of Getty was also adopted. The ID codes can be retrieved from the V&A guide website. As you can see, the V&A provides field IDs for many useful object records, which can even be combined in one API string. Unfortunately, however, Boolean support is limited and cannot be used in a similar way to keyword searches. Thus, even filtering may not find all relevant results. Accordingly, a combination of different methods can bring you closer to your final data set, which you will want to analyze later to answer your research question. You may have wondered why I queried the keyword Egypt. It's because of my research interest in the VNA's photo collection of West Asia and North Africa. I did not come across Egypt as a possible production site of photos by chance. Instead, through clustering object records, I came to the realization that most of the photographs from West Asia and North Africa in the VNA collection were produced in Egypt. Clustering provides a bird's eye view of the data in collections. Rather than finding individual objects by searching and filtering, you instead see the aggregate count of each field, such as material, technique, style, etc., of the object records that match your query. This is useful for exploring the data as it gives a sense of the scale of different aspects of the collection. Moreover, the clusters can be visualized directly in Jupyter Notebook. First, I queried all fields in the object records that match the word Middle East. The output shows that most of the objects matching the keyword Middle East are photos mainly associated with the photographer Francis Fritt and often with the location Egypt. Thus, the next cluster query targeted Egypt. Overall, I gained the overview that Egypt is represented at the V&A mainly through photographs, that the museum has a certain number of photographs made by the British photographer Francis Fritt and that the British art historian K.A.C. Creswell must be closely associated with a photograph collection in some way. In addition, many photographs must have been purchased by the museum or donated to the V&A in the late 20th century. In the next step, I used my knowledge about clustering and identifiers and added some constraining parameters. The Python code shows that for this task, we import the pandas and Altair libraries to analyze and visualize the response to the API request. The query string says that we are looking for clusters of the cluster type category that match the identifier for photography as technique and the identifier for Egypt as place. I added the limiting parameters made before the year and made after the year to restrict the search to a historical framework. Finally, the retrieved data is visualized in the form of a bar chart. Thus, the y-axis indicates the number of objects and the x-axis indicates the clusters or subcategories of the cluster type category. At the end of the Python code, you can name the axis and the charts accordingly. The bar chart is used to answer the research question, which photographic subjects are most represented in the V&A's collection of photographs from Egypt? To approach the question, has the V&A Museum collected photographs of the most well-known photographers who worked in West Asia and North Africa, one would change the API string by replacing cluster type category with cluster type place. Apparently, the curators of the V&A were mainly interested in photos showing architecture. To find out which photographers the V&A Museum has collected, and whether their record matches the list of well-known photographers who were active in West Asia and North Africa, one has to research for cluster type maker. The result shows that the V&A has acquired some prints from famous photographers. The art historian K.A.C. Creswell clearly breaks every record. Based on the bar chart, one could either assume that he was documenting his work on Islamic architecture or that he was as well a collector of photographs that he later donated to the V&A. The final API string I used for my research did not look for clusters, but for objects matching the identifiers of Egypt and photography, 
as well as the limiting parameter of year of production. Other parameters can be used depending on your research question. The final dataset retrieved via the API string is divided into 23 pages, 100 objects per page and sorted by artist. By default, a JSON response is returned. As you can see, the response in this format displays some kind of summary. Therefore, we can add the response format parameter to display the object record fields and thus more detailed information about each of the 2293 objects. The restrained CSV format displays the query record as a spreadsheet. This is good for getting a better feeling for the amount of information contained in the object records fields. To be able to clean, systematize and visualize the entire dataset with other digital tools, the limited CSV format in Jupyter Notebook is not sufficient. To get the entire dataset, exit the Jupyter Notebook workspace and switch to a new browser tab and load the URL in your browser. You will need to create a URL for all 23 pages of the dataset, as you can only view 100 objects at a time. Accordingly, each of the 23 API strings ends with page 1, page 2, page 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, etc. The next step is to insert the 23 URLs in order in the OpenWeFind tool, which combines the 23 pages into a tabular overview. You can then clean your dataset from messy data and systematize it. In the final stages of your project, you can export your dataset from OpenWeFind and visualize it using Stanford University's open source Palladio tool. You can create charts, maps, timelines and networks for your work. Besides all the benefits of API queries, some challenges and limitations should also be mentioned. For example, not all fields of the object records can be accessed online and not all parameters and methods can be combined in one API string. Finally, a museum's inventory system will always show incorrect or missing data. In one particular case, I needed to retrieve the inventory categories, credit line, gallery labels and object history through individual queries that contain the specific inventory number of an object. The dataset we retrieved via the browser at the end of the tutorial does not contain these fields. Nonetheless, this obstacle led me to GitHub, an internet hosting service for software development where I could submit my problem to the developers of the VNA API. This means that they are constantly aware of the problems users encounter and try to improve the query system. In any case, the whole field of digital humanities and therefore the digital services of museums is in constant evolution as the whole field of programming and data analysis. This tutorial is coming to an end now, but the next one will seamlessly follow the last slides in terms of content. You will soon learn some tricks on how to clean up and extend the dataset of your API string in OpenWeFind. I hope you will have the opportunity to query your research questions in Jupyter Notebook and follow up with the tutorial series. Thank you very much for listening.